Everything has been properly posted? Yes, it has. Thank you. And please note that Pat McCaffrey is excused this evening. Moving on to opportunity for citizens to speak. Okay, seeing none, we're going to move on. Is there any other speakers in the audience that did not get a chance to sign up? Okay, action items. Items for board or committee approval. Do I have a motion for midi, uh, minute approval? Yeah, I'll move to approve the July 15, 2019 uh, Safety and Security Committee meeting uh, minutes. Okay, and I'll second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Minute approval passes 2 0. Information items is next. School safety grant update. So uh, thank you. Um, as uh, the last uh, year and a half or so have, have progressed for us, uh, uh, we have uh, been involved with the Was uh, Wisconsin Department of Justice uh, Office of School Safety grants uh, to help improve our security uh, around our district. And um, what I'm proud to say is, is that all of our projects are complete. Um, so we have installed Raptor software, improved the physical security of our buildings, uh, purchased uh, social and emotional learning curriculum uh, to help uh, prevent uh, bullying and, 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 and those student um, uh, you know, interactions. Um, we have uh, provided uh, all of the necessary training around uh, trauma-informed schools, adolescent mental health, uh, threat assessment, um, and so what you see here, uh, I just included um, the last two um, uh, financial submissions uh, to the Department of Justice for reimbursement, and you can see that we have a balance of $2,255. Um, that is uh, reflective of about $1.25 million worth of grant funding. Uh, so we came down to the last $2,000. I don't know if we have any projects hanging out there that we'll be able to put towards the grant, um, but but we have made a lot of progress. Uh, if you remember, or if you remember, as you know, uh, we are doing the, um, the referendum work around the district um, and we've put some uh, local dollars towards security as well. So, so all of the efforts, uh, they continue to be ongoing um, and they'll be ongoing through um, probably the 2020, you know, 2021 as we finish the safety work um, at all of our locations. Um, but just know that this grant, our, our work with the grant, um, will now just fall into some reporting with the Department of Justice. And other than that, we are, we are, um, we've met our obligations. So um, we're very happy and, uh, and proud of the work that we've done. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Do you have any input, Mr. Montijo? Just a brief comment. Yeah, job well done, certainly. Um, regarding the 2002-55, is that a use it or lose it type of thing or? It will be a, it, if, if we do not have $2,255 worth of costs that fit into our grant, it would be lost. Okay. Um, but, you know, in the grand scheme of things, when you start these projects out and you're looking at trying to plan for a, a million two worth of work to come down to the last $2,000, you know, we feel pretty good about all we were able to accomplish. We met everything that we put into the grant. Um, so, so we're, we're happy. We're very happy about that. We trained. In adolescent mental health this summer, we trained 100 staff members um, in, uh, um, in school, uh, adolescent mental health, uh, adolescent mental health in, in threat assessment, we trained another 100 staff members. Um, as part of that training, we were required to provide lunches to people. So we had the, the food piece factored in. I mean, we really looked at this yeah. about as far along the way as we can go. Yeah, job well done. Thanks. Okay, so that is just an information item. Moving on to facility safety improvement update. Mr. Clark? Um, yeah, we... Oops. As Joe mentioned, um, the 11 schools are, we have a few punch list items left from this past summer, but we're in the um, pretty far along in the scheduling of the renovations of the three middle schools. Um, all of which will include an addition um, um, for the secure entrances. And then at South, we'll be doing an addition there uh, as well so we can construct that um, secure entrance. And all of that will begin um, based on um, 
the construction schedule we're looking at right now, um, this in December we'll start some abatement work during Christmas break. Um, but con construction on the additions will start uh, around April 15th, whenever the frost is uh, out of the ground. So um, more details will be coming. We still are working through some details on the construction schedule. But as Joe mentioned, it'll be a summer all next school year and into the next summer. So we're hoping to have all projects done um, by the start of the 21-22 school year. Um, at that point, we'll have, um, and during that time also, right now we're pushing to get the bid documents out for the middle schools and south. Um, we'll get back to design work. We have three elementary schools right now that do not have um, updated secure entrances. They have secure entrances, just not um, renovated ones. Um, and, but some of those we think we might be able to do during the school year. Um, so they probably will go out in a different bid package when that will exactly be done. Um, We'll have a better idea of that um, come probably December, January 1st. So at that time, we'll have all um, secure entrances um, at least bid out and, and scheduled to be completed. Um, just one of the questions that was brought forward by a couple of the board members was the proposal to move the sixth grade from Butler to um, Blair um, and then you know we'll, you know what are we going to do for security at Blair um, we are going to be meeting uh, and taking a walk around Blair tomorrow with the executive cabinet um, given the fact that if you were to go back a school year when Blair had an elementary school there there was a defined office which was at the back of the building and each of the classroom spaces was in full use um, Blair's building was was very well used. I mean, they had interventionists, uh, you know, occupying classroom, you know, multiple interventionists in classroom spaces. Um, they had their library fully used. They had, I mean, every space was used there. And so the feasibility of moving the office into an area that would be, um, that would help of, help with security there um, was very difficult to do when, when students were there. It would not have created a permanent solution for security at the school. But as we go into next school year, if we do move the sixth grade from Butler there, for the one year period of time. There are a couple of measures that we could put in place. It would be more or less temporary as far as how we would locate the office. Would we take over a classroom? Would we direct all of the traffic to the back of the school instead of the front of the building? Um, so we may have some options uh, to make that a little bit more secure of a location. It's also important to note that because of the way the building is set, we never would have been able to put an addition onto the front of the building. And given the footprint of the property, it was very limited. If you went to towards their parking lot, you would have eaten up essentially the only parking space that we had at Blair. The other lot that is near Blair that we use is actually a city of Waukesha parking lot. So it's not even school district property. So it was, it was something that was owned by the city. So um, we, we are gonna be looking at Blair to, to make sure that there are some steps uh, to take. Uh, cameras, buzzers, the whole business, and, and seeing if we can position that office a little bit closer to a door. Um, those are all things that are being considered for that site. I do know some questions came, so we wanted to address those this evening. Thank you. Sorry, I, that walkthrough is tomorrow? Yep, we're gonna have a, have a meeting there tomorrow. Okay. So we're already looking, you know, essentially eight, nine months ahead okay. as to what we could do. Very good, okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Moving on to workplace safety update. Uh, Kevin Miller is here from M3 Years, our consultant. He gives this very similar report every year to this committee. So I thought I'd bring him back um, to update you on where we are, um, mainly on workers' comp, because that's the biggest driver of costs um, in, in the property liability um, and these um, types of coverages. So I think we going to touch a little bit also on our property insurance because we had some unique claim situations and, and talk about the impact of that. So I'll turn it over to Kevin and then we'll be more than happy to answer any questions you might have. Sure, so I know Darren was able to give everybody a copy of this quick little report. Just kind of summarizes what we look at or what has happened since the last meeting. So when I look at these losses, we did go back to the last meeting and then up until basically Friday of last week. <clears throat> but the first page here, this is your experience modification factor and it represents the history. So why is that important? This is a three-year rolling average. So the, the one, that orange line on this first chart, 
shows you that that's where the, all of the school districts are in the state of Wisconsin with their workers' compensation experience, okay? So for the last six years, you've been below one, which means you get a reduction in your workers' compensation premium. Yeah, we're, we're not striving to get to the gold line. We're we trying to run from the gold line. Just... <laughs> this is correct. <laughs> so um, on the top left there where it says experience modification factor statistics, so right now you're at a 0.88. So that means you're saving about 12% on your workers' compensation premium compared to the average school district in the state. Now, what does that mean from a dollar perspective? So your mod did go from 0.83 last year to 0.88 this year. Each point represents about $8,000 in premium. So that is about a $40,000 increase that happened in July for your workers' compensation premium. So there was an increase, but 0.88 is still a good performer as far as the experience is concerned, okay? Just to give you an idea, um, so think of your three, year, three years of uh, your expected losses versus your actual losses, and then there's a rolling average between those three years put together. So what happened with that five-point increase, you had about $225,000 a year <clears throat> fall off, and we added on like a $300,000 loss year, okay? Your expected losses are about $350,000 a year. So you're still performing below what's expected based on the formulas, okay? So then on the right-hand side at the top there, it says workers' compensation statistics. So those numbers represent all of the claims from January 17th of 2019, the last meeting uh, that I presented this to, and then to today, to Friday, excuse me, so October 17th, okay? So the next page is that's what we start to see from uh, uh, lost driver and some statistics here. So the first piece we look at total incurred. Uh, these are losses by occupation, and in the bottom we look at claim count. So we look at this in two ways. So this first page you're gonna see by occupation, and the second page you'll see um, uh, injury type. Injury type, accident type. So what we're trying to do is identify problem areas where we can focus loss control efforts. Nothing out of the ordinary with what we're starting to see here, okay? So the first part, custodial staff, we usually see a lot of injuries in that custodial buildings and ground space. That's pretty normal across the state, okay? The other one is teacher. It's usually our largest group of staff, so we usually see a lot of occurrences in that space, okay? And also some of the injuries as well. The other ones, AIDS. If you look at AIDS in the top of that first one, we see total incurred, so it's the dollar amount. So it's only about $46,000 in total incurred, so that's the losses associated with the claims. But it is 87 claims, so it is a driver from a frequency. And you'll see on the next page, a lot of that is driven by some of the it's either referred to as physically attacked or student behavior claims. So those are the bites, punches, kicks, push down that can occur when you're sometimes handling a special ed student, okay? Any questions on that first page on, on kind of that uh, by occupation? Anything that surprised you? So, I'm sorry. So custodians have a larger <coughs> total <coughs> claim incurred losses but fewer incidences? Correct. So the damages are higher per instance. Yeah, so okay. usually it's a strain or a sprain right. that can relate to some either long time off, and sometimes it's a little more difficult to bring them back to their role, so we have a little bit more pay time because they're off of work for a while. Is that any, um, my malpractice insurance carrier loves to educate us on how not to commit malpractice. <laughs> yes. Which is great because it saves them money. Yep. As far as the custodians, is there any education available or instruction on proper lifting? And I assume this is already done, I guess. Yes. I we do a lot of that with Darren and then with Tim Williamson as well from the building, buildings and ground side. Okay. So we'll focus on areas that can do the, um, the proper lifting techniques, wearing the proper footwear. That's a big one. Uh, you know, just from your car into the building in the winter, just bring a pair of boots, change when you get in. You know, the slick dress shoes or the heels. We have a lot of teacher slip and falls that result in uh, significant injuries there as well. Uh, when you blow out a knee or break an ankle, uh, it ends up being a pretty high dollar amount. Sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You know, I'll hit, the, I'll hit a couple things here too. So there are four specific claims in this data. So of the 300 and what was it, 42,000, so there are four claims over $50,000 in this, okay? So when you see that $382,000 number, there are four claims that are driving almost, let's see, $330,000 of that. Yeah, I was gonna mention the, the mod's climbing, but it's really because of a few particular events, not a, a wave of Correct. You know, $25,000 events. It's We've had some bigger injuries that have resulted in some surgeries. So of those claims, we had a teacher um, that got hurt playing soccer. Uh, that ended up being about $74,000. Uh, 
Um, a custodial lifting some tables hurt their wrist. That was about $60,000. And then um, a teacher fell and broke an ankle. That was about 57. And then um, a custodian fell off a ladder and uh, lots of bruising, no major injuries, but it was about $55,000. So those claims are kind of driving the experience that we're seeing here. Okay. Can I ask about the seasonal? Yep. Just wondering if that is more like slipping on the ice. Is that what that means? It refers to seasonal worker. So okay. usually that's a grounds person. Sometimes it's uh, uh, mowing the lawns, doing the trimming, things like that, that you bring in for the summer help. So how would we know if things are happening in the wintertime, if, if custodians are the ones that are going to be sprinkling the ice or the sand, if they're the ones that are get, falling first, how would we know that here? You wouldn't know that in the info I have here, but we do look into that data further. We, can, we look at it by month, and then we can dive into the, we dive into the slips and falls. Uh, we dive into the slips and falls all the time. So if you turn the page, uh, you'll see the slips and falls. We've got 44 slips and falls and then $125,000 in total incurred associated with that. That is always a driver. Um, I have not broken that down here for you, but we do look at that as a district. Yep. So to give you more information, so the, the slips and the falls are actually broken down in almost six categories. So there's slip and fall from elevation, slip and fall on stairs, slip and fall on wet surface, slip and fall, we don't know why. Um, those are all kind of, they get grouped into those categories. We put them all together so it's easier to look at, uh, but that's what helps us identify some of those things. Well, if a majority of them were happening in the winter, I think that would just be helpful to know. Yes, we can look at that. Okay. And also another peak time um, in my experience is uh, the spring when you have the thaw freeze, thaw freeze going on constantly and the, the parking lot's fine and then you go out at night to go home and there's that patch of ice is formed. Um, so we do communication and those types of things about proper footwear and try to hit that those spots with salt because they're the same spots, the flow is the same every year, um, to try to identify and to notify um, people as much as possible. And we've done communication with the schools in the past, the buildings specifically, so which door they're to enter. So during the winter, sometimes buildings and grounds can't get to the entire parking lot, but there's a door staff should go through because that's the one they'll focus on right away in the morning and then at night, so that that area is hopefully taken care of. It's hard to get the entire parking lot done before staff shows up at six o'clock in the morning sometimes. Any questions on the workers' compensation? Of course, that's the big piece we kind of focus on initially. Okay. The other one Darren asked me to just give you a quick update on was the uh, property claim at Summit View. So um, back in December of 18, uh, there was a sprinkler head. Let me give you the right term. A sprinkler line flow meter broke. If you'd like to know what that is, I'm not the right person to ask. <laughs> but sounds important, though. It sounds really important, yes. But when that broke, um, it just resulted in flooding, uh, high pressure water coming out of that pipe. Uh, it happened about midnight on that evening and ran until someone came in and found it. By then, it had flooded the lobby and the library, and it occurred on the second floor, so it seeped down into the first floor and then created the flooding throughout uh, those areas. So um, it doesn't sound too bad, but water is a very, very bad thing. And uh, total incurred on that claim right now is right around $930,000, okay? So the point of bringing that up that will have impact on future property renewals. So it's uh, one of the things that we'll track as we go forward. And uh, the property insurance market in general is changing. So between those two things, we may see a tougher renewal on that property insurance in the future. Okay. And at this point, everything's, I think everything was done. We're just finishing up a couple bills. There were some cabinets that were finished over the summer. Yeah, that's the last thing um, I was aware of. So yeah, of every, everything's been repaired and it happened right at winter break. So we didn't even miss a day of school with it. We were able to have it dried out enough to get uh, the kids back to school after winter break. I, I was in there, I think a few days after the incident, I was universally impressed by how the staff there handled it, how the district handled it. It was dealt with I didn't see any problems or hear any problems. I don't know the parents. It's where my, my daughters went to school and I still okay. have a student there or a daughter there. It was unbelievably how they jumped in and got it done. Yeah. Um, and it looked great. And I'm way out of my league here, but as there are carbon monoxide sensors, as there are other sensors, is there a flood sensor? Perfect, 
Perfect segue, thank you. <laughs> so this is actually something we'll, we're talking to Tim a little bit about, Tim Williamson from Buildings and Grounds. There are um, uh, water meter sensors. So basically the, what that sensor would do is it would track any um, significant changes in water flow. So the benefit to that being when that thing went off, if all of a sudden we're going through 10,000 gallons of water a minute, someone's gonna get an alarm and we would get there sooner and uh, then that can be monitored. So yes, there are other sensors that can be used on mechanical equipment. Um, the reason, the, the question mark, that flow meter, I think just that might say. actually been part of what monitors it. So it, it could have been just that worst case scenario of what broke. Um, but yeah, that is something that we have discussed. Okay, is that something you are? Tim is looking into it. Okay. So it, it's, it's, uh, we can make the recommendation. It's not something the insurance companies offer, okay. but it is a system that you can purchase. Okay. Yeah, because so you can do the, um, uh, you can do the water and you can also do uh, like electrical. So it would capture, if uh, there was a hot spot and a lot of wattage was going through an area, that would capture it as well. So I think you call it a sprinkler line flow meter. It sounds like exactly what it's supposed to do, but it's, perhaps that's that broke my south. thought too. Okay. It goes south on you, right? Yeah, and it floods. Okay. Yeah. Very well. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Other than that, I don't, can't think of anything. Nothing else big going on. We're also working with Kevin on the construction projects because we, especially with the additions, we'll need new lines of coverage. Builder's risk. In the scope of all the costs, it's not a big thing, but it's something that uh, we'll be working on in, in leading up to um, or to uh, next April. So, but otherwise, we're doing pretty well, I think. Yep. Minus a few couple expensive falls here and there, but. And the general contractor will uh, ha already has those costs built into the mm -hmm. not the referendum, but the building project costs yep. for the builder's risk. So, it wouldn't be a new charge or a surprise charge. Be part of the project. Thank you, Kevin. Great, thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, moving on. We have nonviolent crisis intervention training update. Yeah, so as you uh, had an opportunity to look at the staff injury report, um, one of the things that we do to try to reduce that is provide training and nonviolent crisis intervention um, to any staff that are working with a student who may become dysregulated over the course of the school day, particularly our administrators, our special education staff, uh, both our teachers and our aides, and then our student services staff, our psych social workers and counselors, so that if they are responding to a situation where a student's um, becoming dysregulated, they're able to use a approach that doesn't necessarily require hands-on. Um, we try to de-escalate things before that. And so um, <clears throat> last week, um, we, I, I checked in with Karen Peterson, uh, who has led this training for us, and we have 419 staff members uh, who are trained in nonviolent crisis. Uh, so if you were to look at our teachers and our aides, um, that would be, we've total in the district, we probably have somewhere around 1,300, 1,400 staff. 419 of those uh, individuals are trained as of this point. Um, we are providing 22 training sessions this school year. Uh, seven refresher trainings. So the refresher trainings are for individuals who have been trained and need to get every two years, um, they'll do a training and then two years later they have to go through a refresher course. And then we're gonna be providing 15 classes in the foundation. So that's for individuals who have not yet been trained. Uh, we do have a number of new special ed staff, a number of new aides uh, on, on our staff this year. Um, so we're gonna make sure that we get those individuals trained as soon as possible. We also provide that training, as I said, throughout this course of the school school year uh, because we do have aides that get hired uh, as the year goes forward. We try to get them trained as soon as we possibly can. Um, and we have a handful of staff in the district um, who are trained trainers. So five of our staff uh, act as trainers for these sessions. So we're able to provide them um, on a scheduled basis, but then also on an as needed basis as the year goes on. So the 22 sessions, or at least the 15 classes for just people that have not had any. Why are we offering so many? Is it one is going to be at each site every twice a month or something? So if someone was at Summit View, could they go to South? Is it, why do we have so many? Is it to accommodate the teachers? It's to accommodate, we don't, we, we try to run the classes at a manageable size. So I think we try to shoot for 10 to 12 staff in a, in a class because there is a, a large portion of the afternoon is spent um, 
you know, physically handling each other in the event that you would have to do it with a student so you can train techniques. Um, uh, how to de-escalate, how to use language before you'd have to put it on. So we need to have an opportunity for the enough staff to be there where it's meaningful, but not so many staff there that our trainer can't work with each individual aide or teacher uh, through the training sessions. Excellent. So then is there a cutoff once it's full, they have to go to the next class or wait? Yeah, yeah. And, and given where we're at with staff, the number of staff that are trained in that kind of that rotating basis that we have of refreshers and, and, and foundations classes, we found that we're able to accommodate it. This is far more classes that had been offered in the, plat, in the past. So the 22 classes um, is a large number of classes, but but again, we've our, as I've shared in, in some other forums at the, like the Teaching and Learning Committee, the number of students that we have in Waukesha right now who have been identified as having a special education need has gone up um, in the last, I just looked at the data today, I want to say it goes back about the last seven or eight years. Um, and so what we want to be able to do is make sure that we're able to meet those kids' needs. So hence the reason why we have more classes. Excellent. And who's required to take the classes? Any special educator is required to take the class. So a teacher or an aide is required. So at what point will they have all been, are the, is it mandatory by the end of this year or? Well, it, it's anybody who's been on with us, it's been required of them. Okay. When you hire new staff and you get them on board, um, you know, our teaching staff gets done early in the school year. Our aid staff, it takes a while because we do have a number of resignations as the year goes on. So you may hire an aide, get them trained, and then get a resignation. And then you have to train whoever you rehire. So that's why we have this, this rotation go throughout the year. So if a regular K through five teacher has children in their classroom that do have aides, the aides might be certified, but that regular classroom teacher is not? If we're ever in a situation where we had a lot of kids in a classroom, we would require that that teacher get trained as well. So the number of the 419 staff, it does exceed the number of individuals we have working in special education. There are general ed staff trained, but we, we try to primarily focus on getting this special education staff. It is the priority. Um, students who would require this de-escalation would in, in most cases have an aid with them or be heavily involved with a special education teacher. What about principals and secretaries? Yes. Principals, yes. Secretaries, no. Uh, health room teachers? No. Or health room staff? We haven't had the health room staff trained, no. I mean, we could if it were needed. That's why we have the classes. But we've really focused. I mean, the, the response team would be the teacher, the psych social worker, counselor, the special education staff. So we, we have we believe, the appropriate number of staff in our schools to respond, knowing that we're getting more kids who have needs, and we need to continue to offer the training. If it's a special, like Fayed, Art, there's always an aid in there? Not always, no. Do they? Are they certified? Depends on if it's needed or not. Okay. And who determines if it's needed? The principal, the special ed staff, and IEP team would determine if, what the level of training would be. Thank you. I do. It's obviously a really important issue. Um, I guess my concern is more along with Ms. Reinecek was asking about if there's a special ed student that's in a, stu in a classroom that does not have an aide or a special ed teacher and there's an incident where there's it's escalating, what's the procedure for responding? I would hope I, I, there needs to be someone trained in the room to deal with it immediately, I would think. So how do we deal with that? Well, you, we have a lot of staff trained. I guess I would start out by saying that. Right. To look at your scenario it would be virtually impossible for me to guarantee that somebody would be there every possible day, right? People right. get sick. Sure. So within the scope of the school year where there's illness, there is a response team in each school. So either the principal, the psychologist, the dean of students, an assistant principal, um, somebody would be in that school who could help respond. Immediately, that's not practical. Um, as soon as possible, absolutely. How? Um, because okay. you're our subs, which as you guys, if you've you know been on the, Human Resources Committee in the, in the past few years, you know, our, our subs, we have about three or 400 subs that could work for us in the district. And so when you have a sub pool that large, you may or you may not get somebody who has been trained. Um, what we try to do is make sure that there's a person in place that would then cover in somebody's absence. But the sub, having all the subs trained, is, is it's not a practical step. I guess my thought, let me ask it this way. How many hours does it take to get trained? Do we know? Uh, it's an eight-hour training. It is. Okay. Is that a, 
over one multiple day. one day. Okay. Um, and then it's a four hour refresher. Okay. Is the district thought about training all of its employees? If we're getting teachers. We would have to try to find time to do that. Okay. Where, where we're currently right now, I think we're limited to about 15 staff a day because of how hard it is to find subs. 15 staff a day can get pulled out from our district for professional development. Okay. So when you try to look at the number of people that we would bring in for training, it would be great to get to that point. Um, but given the number of staff that we have trained currently, the number of trainings that we're offering, staff turnover, I think getting to a point where we would all be trained would be a would be a difficult time because you'd have to look at when do you do it, how do you compensate the individuals for coming in for that, um, how do you find enough subs to cover it. Um, it's something that we're working towards. That's um, assuming if you pull them out of the school day, but if you do it towards, you know, on the off days or um, I, the, the term is staff development days, something right. like that, or training in the beginning of the year or something like that. But, right, okay. and you'd have to prioritize this then over literacy and math and the other things then that are offered on those days. Well, okay. Um, all right. As part of this training, is there a, a book or a pamphlet or something about there the materials? Is. Okay. All right. Yep. yep. There's, right. A, there's a book for the participants. Um, it is the guiding document that is used during the training. Okay. So it's not something that's provided. Uh, we haven't created our own. It does come from uh, NVCI. Okay. Is that something I could get a copy of or have a, a chance to look at? You could at? come in and, and take a look at it. The books are only released to the individuals who are trained. Okay. Um, because we just don't disperse those materials. We wouldn't want anybody to walk away um, under the guise that they've been trained when they haven't been trained. It would just be for me, but okay. Um, are there SROs trained in this or do they have something separate or similar? The SROs are trained in de-escalation through the police department. Um, I don't believe that they have been trained in nonviolent crisis because if they are going to put their hands on, they're doing so as, an, as a police officer, not as a school employee. And the district has no authority to instruct these officers to be trained? We, we can't right. require that they be trained and use these techniques. The police department could, could ask them to participate in it, and, and, and we could work on that. We haven't used them in that capacity yet, though. Okay. Very good. We want our staff to be providing this de-escalation. We want our teachers to be able to do it. We don't want to get to a point where we're putting hands on kids. Um, it's a last resort for us. Agreed. Okay, thank you. If, <clears throat> what have you heard as far as feedback from the people who have been trained? Have they been able to use it and given stories and testimonies that it's been helpful? What have you heard as far as feedback? <clears throat> it's been something that we've been doing so long. It's almost something that it's kind of how we've operated here. Um, having gone through the training myself, the verbal de-escalation, the training in that is something that you just don't get as a teacher and teacher training. So I found that when I was teaching very valuable. Um, as an administrator, when I worked in smaller districts and had daily contact where I was assigned, you know, my first job as an assistant principal and director of pupil services in a small district, I used the, the de-escalation techniques on a regular basis. What I have seen is since schools have implemented this is fewer student injuries, fewer staff injuries, fewer needs to put hands on. I began my teaching career and this was not discussed. Um, you know, it was, you know, you did your best to break up fights at that particular time, but you, you didn't have the techniques that are offered in this. Um, so it's been very valuable on the proactive side. Reactively, it's kept staff and students safe. No. Thank you. And I mean, I think you can see that in, in the data. When, when you do have the number of reports, um, we're to look on the second page under physical attack and struck by. Um, you know, you can see that there, I think, what is that, 161 instances um, that account for $34,000, $35,000 worth of claims, um, which I don't want to minimize that dollar amount, nor do I want to minimize the number of instances, but it hasn't resulted in a level of injury. Um, whereas you see some of the slips and falls and, and such where you're 50, 60. Seventy thousand dollars. So, agreed. Well, thank you, Dr. Cook. 
Moving on to discussion items. We don't have any tonight. And other business, we have recommendations for future committee meetings. Mr. Montijo, do you have any? Not right now, but I will consider it. Okay. Do we have any other as needed? I think as we go forward, we'll continue to update you on the proposed building projects um, and, and where we're at as, as we get ready for, um, ready for that construction work uh, coming up. Um, we can provide you some updates on the things that we did within the school gr safety grant. Um, you know, see where we're at with Raptor hits. Um, you know, the software that we're using to screen visitors uh, into our schools against the sex offender registry. Um, and then any suggestions that the committee may have. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>